All right, welcome to another episode of the TFD Performance Podcast. I'm joined by TFD Performance Dietitian, Mr. Ryan, the Dojo Hassel. Dojo. Hey, Jordy. How you going? Yeah, good, good. Good as your mustache, as good as your mullet. <laughs> so happy Friday. Really, really good episode today. Something that we've been getting blasted on in our Q&As. Every week, I get at least 10, 15 questions. What are your thoughts on seed oils? What are your thoughts on seed oils? Can you break down seed oils? What's the go with this? And that's exactly what we're going to do today. Uh, Dojo has been busy digging into the research and going really, really deep to find, okay, well, what is the answer to this? And like good scientists, we're not just immediately going to dismiss it and we'll, we'll talk about it in its entirety. But really what Dojo was doing was trying to find some answers and reasons. Okay, well, why could they be bad? Well, let's look at what the research is and maybe seed oils are bad. And it's something we've just entirely missed and it's just been brought to light. But we're going to talk about that. Let's, uh, let's, let's dive straight into it because we don't want to waste time. It's a really interesting episode. Let's start off straight off the bat. Just make us all aware, Dojo, for people listening, if they don't understand what seed oils are, explain what they are to us. All right. So seed oils, it's kind of like a, a newer way of just saying vegetable oils. So these are oils that we've all used like for our whole lives. It's not like a new product that's come onto the market or anything, but it's basically just a, a name that's been given to plant oils that come from seeds. So if you think of like your canola oils, um, like safflower oils, things like soy oils, soybean oils, all of those types of oils are technically derived from seeds. So they're like from a scientific point of view, if you really want to like get into the weeds of it, they're technically not vegetable oils, even though those are like plants. They're considered seed oils. So like that's kind of like the main distinction here is that's that's what we're talking about. So these oils that come from seeds. Now, a lot of the thing that's been kicked up, like a lot of the, the noise has been kicked up around seed oils and, and calling them bad for us is um, because these types of oils, because they come from seeds, like it's, it's I don't want to say it's a new process, but like it's not technically a natural process. So you don't find seed oils when you're in nature, like you wouldn't like squeeze out some <laughs> seeds and then like a bit of oil comes out. Like it takes a lot, a lot of seeds all like um, refined together um, to, to make a small amount of, of these seed oils. And so what happens is a lot of the time, these seed oils are kind of a byproduct of the production of something else. So one example that gets used a lot is the production of um, wine from grapes. And then the seeds are kind of like a waste product. They get taken and instead of throwing them out and wasting them, they then get used to, to make something else that they can sell, which um, they, they turn into grapeseed oil. Um, but I guess it's what will be important to kind of like unpack here now that we understand what seed oils are. Uh, what are some of the claims that are getting tossed at seed oils? Um, the, they've been labeled a lot um, by different people, um, both on social media and sometimes in, in science as well as, as being like unhealthy. Um, so let's, let's take a look at that. Um, what what sort of health claims have you heard being thrown around so far about seed oils, Jordy? Yeah, I guess they're all negative, right? And I think if anyone is an avid user of social media, you would have heard some pretty influential figures talking about it and how seed oils is basically the root cause of all illness in the human society these days. So I, everything, right? Like I've heard everything from the reason that we're overweight and obese is because of seed oils. The reason, underlying reason for a lot of chronic disease is because of the overconsumption of seed oils. The reasons that we are so lethargic and we have no energy throughout the day is because we consume too many seed oils and it affects so many different bodily systems in a negative way. So let's unpack it. Let's unpack it, Dojo. Let's first go what are the claims for you know seed oils being bad? And then let's have a look. What does the evidence actually say? Because it's important to remember, we need to look at the evidence when we're talking about these things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so as you said, like literally basically any chronic health condition that exists at the moment has some sort of like has been blamed um, or has been linked to seed oils. Um, and I don't mean that as like scientifically linked, but there's just people that are drawing connections here. So um, anything from like heart disease, like mental stuff, um, things like inflammation, autoimmune diseases, things like asthma. People are saying that this is why allergies are developing more and more is because of, of seed oils. So to kind of understand the thinking here, we're going to kind of like separate out like where, where are these claims coming from? How are they linking these things to seed oils? And then let's take a look at, at what actually is like kind of real here. So 
there's there's a couple of main points that get thrown around and that get used to link seed oils to all of these health conditions. Um, one of the main ones here is something that we call omega-6 fatty acids or omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids. It's a bit of like a, uh, a long name, but essentially what that is is a type of fat. Um, I guess it probably helps to explain like what the different types of fats are. I'm pretty sure we've done a podcast on fat, so maybe go back and listen to that if you're not exactly sure um, on the terms here. I might just gloss over that so we're not getting too dug into the different types of fats, but we have three main types of fats, um, saturated, and then we've got um, unsaturated, which can be broken down into two more, which is our like omega-6 and omega-3s. So that's kind of like a nutshell. Well, there's like trans fats as well. We'll get to that. So these omega-6s um, are a type of unsaturated fatty acid. Now, in the past, there's been some studies, um, and it's not something that we fully understand yet, but there's some studies that suggest that omega-6 fatty acids might be linked with increased inflammation. They're involved in some of the inflammatory pathways in the body. Um, now, inflammation is another thing that's associated as being bad. It's it's a natural process. We, we need inflammation for certain things. Um, but what kind of gets thrown around here is we have the omega-6s, which are these sort of like, you could call them, I guess, like pro-inflammation fatty acids. And then our omega-3s, which you hear about a lot, like fish oils, um, the, the type of ones that you supplement for reducing inflammation, joint health, that kind of thing. These are another type of polyunsaturated fatty acids. Now, in seed oils, we find a lot more of the omega-6 fatty acids. And so one of the claims that gets thrown around is that by having a lot of seed oils in your diet, you're kind of throwing this balance out of whack and you're having more of the, uh, the pro-inflammatory ones and less of the anti-inflammatory ones. And that's leading to a lot of these um, like autoimmune conditions, inflammation things, um, and like a lot of chronic health conditions. Um, and so the people that are kind of like making these links, a lot of them, unfortunately, this is like, uh, and we'll get to chatting about this in a second, but if you, if you take a look at the people that are like drawing these connections, a lot of them come from the perspective of um, unsaturated fats are less healthy. We need to have more saturated fats in our diet. Therefore, we should be having more um, animal fat sources. So you, you hear this, this omega-6 argument a lot from especially people that are big in like the carnivore um, meat diet space. Um, so far, everything that I've been able to find in terms of like the, the overarching like scientific consensus here is that, and, and there's been like a really recent um, meta-analysis study, which I don't know if, if you guys listening in, um, I'm too sure about the different types of studies. Um, a meta-analysis of like randomized control trials is basically the gold standard. Like it's basically the highest level of evidence that you can get on a particular topic. They will look at like hundreds of other individual studies and kind of summarize, okay, what is the, the general consensus of, of what these studies have found? So they had a really recent one of these done not too long ago that looked at this, the effects of these omega-6 fatty acids on health outcomes. And they basically found that there's no real evidence for omega-6s, even if it, they're consumed in like high amounts, th there's no real connection there between um, omega-6s in the diet and these adverse health outcomes. So um, in most cases, it's still generally going to be better to have more omega-6s in your diet or to um, include them in your diet in the place of these saturated fats that come from animal products, um, which is kind of the opposite of what the carnival people would want you to hear because they want you to think, okay, omega-6s are bad. We need to get rid of seed oils. We need to replace them with animal fats. And the actual, like the opposite is actually true in this case. Um, omega-6s are probably still going to be healthier for you than having um, or like cooking things in like animal fats and, and all of that kind of thing. So that's kind of like the, the first argument here is, is those omega-6s. Um, did you have anything like any takes on that one, Jordy? Yeah, I can completely understand where they come from, right? Even when I went through university, I remember learning even epidemiological studies the, that showed that we were consuming too much omega-6. And the ratio, the the supposed golden ratio that we used to think was a thing between omega threes and omega six consumption was completely out of whack, and we got taught about that. That may be a contributing factor, but like Dojo said, a lot of this is coming from people who are in a particular 
mindset or a part of a particular movement. And just being a part of that, you need to appreciate that there's going to be a degree of bias. And something we're going to talk about a little bit more once we get on and we talk about, you know, the other evidence on the other side of the coin for omega-6 is, is it's important to realize that human physiology is extremely complicated. Even when we talk about fatty acid metabolism, like we're just talking about it in such a simple form, right? Like we're talking about mm-hmm. it in terms of unsaturated fats, saturated fats, not even really breaking it down into monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, going through all the different types, omega-3s, omega-6s, omega-9s. We're not going through all of that. All of them will play a role in fatty acid metabolism. And we're still not to a point where we completely entirely understand the in in its entirety in the whole picture of human metabolism, how each one of these fats contribute. So what we have to do is we have to look at the evidence and we look at these papers and we look at these correlations and we have to make our best assumption. And I think from the totality of evidence, when we look at it, what's going against omega-6 is all when we're trying to find links, okay, if increased omega-6 is bad, what's the evidence for that? And what are the links? we generally don't tend to find it when you look at really good, like they just said, randomized control trials. You look at meta-analysis of big groups of these randomized control trials. Even though there's a lot still to be learned about fatty acid metabolism, from the evidence we still have, we just don't tend to see that these omega-6s or these seed oils are linked with all these adverse health effects that all these social media people are claiming. Yeah, and we'll... I'll, I'll, um... I'll comment on the, the levels of evidence and stuff in a second, but I um I just want to go over there's so like there's probably two other main health claims or or like kind of um I guess red flags that people would point to in terms of linking these seed oils to um, negative health outcomes. So let's let's unpack those a little bit. The first one is um trans fats, and then the second one is like the, the process is involved with actually making the seed oil. So um, actually we'll go over the, the process of making the seed oils first because that, that's probably um, one of the first ones that pops up in terms of people will say that seed oils are unnatural. And I kind of hinted at that at the start of this um, when I was saying that it takes a lot of seeds just to make a little bit of seed oil. There's a lot of processing that goes into that in order to, to take all of those seeds and, and generate that small amount of seed oil. In a lot of cases with these seed oils, they tend to be, as I said before, they, they used to be in a lot of processes like a waste product that was just thrown out. Now they've come up with ways to process them a little bit more, clean them up, maybe take some different tastes or, or flavors out of them to make them more, I guess, like palatable. And then you're able to use them in more applications. So you're able to fry with them. You're able to add them to, to salads and stuff. And you're not going to have these like weird tastes or, or whatever that um, like people probably just wouldn't buy it. So there's a couple of different processes going in. Um, and in order to do that, like a lot of food processing involves using chemicals to take things out or add things in. And in most cases, and like this is regulated pretty well in like a lot of countries, a lot of these chemicals that are used in order to like extract certain parts of the, the molecules out or add things in in order to like make the fats like cleaner or, or take smells out or take flavors out, a lot of these chemicals they're used, but then they're removed like pretty well from these these products. So there's like not they're not just like putting chemicals in and then that's it. Like and you're getting some little toxic slurry of of like fat and and bleach or something on your plate. Like they take a lot of it out, but there is like always the argument that like people in these sort of industries have been known to cut corners before. So to try and make the claim that like, okay, they're taking everything out. It's all going to be perfect. You can't really say that. So there is a chance that these like um, these processes are going to be leaving behind trace amounts of um, chemicals, whether or not they're potentially hazardous. Um, so like that is actually a pretty decent argument for um, why or like, like maybe against like seed oils. But that's also true for basically every other processed food that we eat. So um, just labeling that as something that exists only in seed oils is pretty inaccurate. Um, any sort of food that you buy off the shelf that hasn't just gotten picked out of the the um, farm and like and put into like the the fresh produce section is gonna go through some sort of processing and potentially contain some of these products. Even the foods that we get in the the fresh produce section, right? Like they they unless they're like organic, they're gonna be having some level of 
maybe like pesticides or some sort of chemicals there like basically everything in this day and age that we eat is going to have some level of like whether or not it's like plastics or, or chemicals like this stuff it it can get pretty scary when you start to think about what actually goes on behind the scenes of food processing but this point is basically just to say like it's not exclusive just to seed oils that this stuff happens it's across the board for all foods and probably needs to be tightened up and regulated more like across the board not not just in in seed oils um and then the last one just to to kind of like briefly go over is is trans fats um there's there's not much to talk about here other than that the the claim is that like in in these processes that um, lead to the production of these seed oils you get some level of trans fat production um, and that's a pretty strong argument like trans fats are really bad they've been linked to all sorts of cardiovascular diseases all sorts of health diseases um, or like like negative health outcomes chronic diseases the problem here is that the people that kind of lean into this argument that seed oils are bad they have trans fats blah 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 they're usually people from like the carnivore space again unfortunately it's kind of like one group that seems to be really going hard against the seed oils so it's kind of just good to identify where this is coming from but they'll say things like okay seed oils have high trans fats no amount of trans fats are safe like we shouldn't be having these these foods like they're an evil food they shouldn't be on the market the problem here is like while there is some level of trans fats a lot of the time what they don't talk about is how low the amount of trans fats are um, and then maybe like comparison between different foods here right so if we look at how much trans fat is actually produced in these seed oils um, I think what, what I found was like some, it can be as low as like 2% um, of the fat content of these oils can be trans fats, which in most cases, in most like um, developed countries, that's considered to be so low that they don't even have to label it on the package um, because it's, it's not considered to be um, like high enough to have any sort of impact, right? Now, if we look at the other side, okay, the, the carnival people are kind of the, the ones pointing fingers about this, but when we look at, at meat and like animal fats and uh, I guess particularly like red meat, I guess is a, is a good example of that. Um, trans fats, while they occur synthetically in like food production and they come out in seed oils, they also occur naturally through the process of rumination, which is like a whole other thing, but that's basically the process of how things like animals like cows and um, other animals that eat grass, and they digest it they go through this process called rumination and that actually produces trans fats as well and those trans fats end up in the fat in the meat that you're eating and meat trans fat content can be um like i was looking into the numbers on this and it's almost identical to that that you would find in like seed oils so it's around somewhere like two to three percent so it's going to be if not the same maybe even a little bit more trans fat content within meat as it would be in seed oil so it's a pretty like weird argument for them to make that trans fats are, are terrible and we, we should be avoiding these foods but then on the same hand say like we should eat exclusively meat because like then we'll be getting the same amount of trans fat like it, it doesn't really um add up there but so in a nutshell those are kind of the three main arguments Jordy. the first one being the the high omega-3 uh, the sorry the high omega-6 content um the the chemicals involved in the processing and then the trans fat content um now in terms of the, the the arguments and like where all these things are going from we kind of chatted you mentioned just before about like the levels of evidence here right like when it comes to science there's definitely levels to this like the for sure it's it's hard to just like like create a scientific paper and get it published but there are ways to do this so like in general the scientific process is very rigorous you, you do a study it has to get checked by other researchers from another institution they have to clear it that's called like the peer review system. Then it gets submitted to a, um, a journal. Then the journal can say like, okay, this is good quality content or no, like your research sucks. Maybe you need to change your methods or do something differently. It can go back and forward. It's a very rigorous process. There's a lot involved in terms of getting a paper to be published through like a good quality journal. So this is kind of like one of the ways that we can assess. It's not always super accurate but it's, it's a good kind of like barrier to entry for getting scientific information across. Usually it has to be cleared by a lot of different scientists from a lot of different places in order to be like, okay, this is some good solid evidence. And then there's even different levels to the studies themselves that get published. Now on the other side of that, and this is something that, that definitely happens and it seems to be like from a lot of the papers that I was reading that were kind of like 
suggesting these ideas against like CDOs. There are other options when it comes to um, publishing papers. And so like one of them is, is using things like open access journals or like less reputable journals. So that whole rigorous process that I talked about, that mainly goes on within like the bigger journals that are more, uh, they have like more reputation. But there's other journals that just want to get papers published to kind of like build their own reputation. So they'll kind of let things through. And when you look at a lot of these papers that come out and they say things like omega-6s are like the leading cause of heart disease or um, like like CEDOs are, are like the like devil's gift to earth. Like, I don't know, like <laughs> these like weird claims. They will, a lot of the time, I'm not saying all the time, like sometimes there are ones that get published in, in like reputable journals. But a lot of the time, these are kind of like fringe papers coming from not so reputable journals um, that are kind of like promoting these ideas and then they get cross published by other papers that then kind of like build on those ideas and they also are the kind of the, the papers that get talked about by these people that are then talking to us and like the general public being like oh my god CEDAWs are so bad look there's this study that I found that shows this without really questioning the level of evidence of of that study so that's kind of like what I wanted to say here is like it, and it, this is something that's difficult, like, unless you're in the science space to be able to look at and be like, oh, this paper is like a bit questionable, like, which is why we rely on people to present us with this information. But I think there's a couple of things and we can talk about this story is like, what to look for when people are giving this information to decide ourselves, whether or not we can kind of rely on it. So do you want to kind of make a comment about that? Yeah, that's really important, right? Because and this is a big thing in the nutrition space. I think because we all have doctors in our lives and, 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 you know, I've ex I experienced it recently, right. Where, where I had some, some incidents when I was uh, pushing my body a little too hard and ended up in the emergency. And I relied very heavily on the expertise of the doctors there. And I think we take that expertise and don't get me wrong. They are fantastic at what they do when it comes to medical science in within that medical community, nutrition and nutrition science and, Nutrition research is an entirely different field. And you need to remember that medical doctors do not receive any nutrition training. I have friends who are doctors. I have quite a lot of friends who are doctors. I have friends who are specialists and they all told me they received two lectures. It's probably changed now since, since the 10 years I've been at university, but they received two, one, one lecture on vitamins and one lecture on minerals. And that was it. And that was their nutrition training. So you need to appreciate they don't get the level of training required necessarily. And then a lot of what they do know is postgraduate or it's out of their own curiosity, which is absolutely fine. What you need to understand though, is that we usually use this term, say like scientist or doctor or whatever. And that itself brings a, a level of reputable source to the general public. Like you hear that and you go, oh yeah, they're reputable. They're reputable. You need to appreciate as well though, not all scientists are great at interpreting research and then communicating that research. And we tend to think that doctors, for whatever reason, are just the entire whole package that they can do everything. And I'm not, I'm not throwing shade on doctors. Like if I've, if I've got problems with my heart, I'm going to go to a cardiovascular doctor and they're going to be able to help me. Same as if, you know, you've got diabetes, you go to a doctor who specializes in that, they will be able to help you. What we tend to see now on social media is a lot of doctors go outside of that scope of expertise. And a lot of them probably aren't that well-trained in scientific research. And then on top of that, not trained in scientific nutrition research and they take all of these all of these i'd say quarter truths or quarter explorations i would say where you have to explore the concept further and they just take it as a full truth and then they throw it out and people believe it because they've got that md or they've got some type of qualification as a scientist next to their name so i think that's something as someone listening to this and someone consuming information especially on social media you need to be very 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 aware of Mm. yeah and I think like a, a good way to kind of look at that and see I mean like it's not always the case that there's like ulterior motives going on here but um as you said like a lot of these people will kind of rely on their um credentials whether or not that's like a, a PhD in something completely unrelated or like a, a doctor's degree and then kind of take that and run with the, the prestige that comes with that title and then just decide that they're an expert on something that's kind of like out of their field. And like one of the benefits, if, if you look at it, like who's who's benefiting here, like one of the benefits is they're able to sell a lot of this information because oftentimes to get to that level in whatever their 
their speciality is they're obviously going to be pretty switched on good communicators all of that kind of stuff and then they find this weird niche where people are looking for answers they're maybe they're unhappy with their how their lives are going they're looking for a reason but maybe something to blame um, maybe they're like unhappy with their, their body or their current health situation they might have health problems and they're just they're just unhappy and they're looking for something to blame and then someone comes along who's they're a doctor or they're a PhD person and they know the reason that you're obese or the reason that you have this health problem it's because of insulin or it's because of um, like gluten or in this case it's because of seed oils like it gives someone something to blame and that's something that they can get behind and then for that person presenting that information to them now that's someone who's going to buy off them there's, there's someone who's going to buy into their personal brand there there's a lot for them to benefit in that situation which is something you kind of have to think about here i'm not saying that's like everyone's motive that's in this space maybe there are some people who are generally tr trying to help um help their their audience and stuff like that but it is definitely something that you have to kind of like take a step back and look at who benefits from from what they're saying and another thing here is like when i kind of mentioned there's that, that whole process of the scientific um process and then maybe some sort of back doors that people can go through one of the things that we kind of see here is like the people that are presenting these ideas they should have a level of understanding of these topics where they can start to like like sway their other colleagues and other scientists in their sort of like train of thought so you kind of have to ask yourself how come how come they're bringing these ideas to me who someone someone who doesn't have that much understanding of science someone who may be easily influenced how come they're giving that information to me and trying to sell me stuff rather than trying to present this information to the scientific community and sway the whole scientific community because if their evidence was as good as they say it is there's a strong chance that the scientific community would be like, oh, wow, like this is something we have to really look into. Um, and then you would see shifts in like the, the sort of like general health recommendations. Um, like there's there's a lot going on behind the scenes in terms of like the scientific process and where all these health recommendations and stuff come from. So a lot of the time it's easier for them with these kind of like fringe views to be like, oh, well, I can't be bothered. Um, or maybe like the evidence just isn't strong enough, but like I believe in it. So maybe there's like a bit of bias going on to so then rather like maybe they try and convince the other scientists and the other scientists are like, nah. And they're like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to go talk to someone who maybe doesn't have as much understanding in this and then try and convince them. So like, yeah, you kind of have to ask yourself why, why are they presenting this information to me rather than trying to like change the scientific consensus? Um, because oftentimes, as you said, Geordie, when these people are good at communicating, it's easy for them to sway people that don't really understand the topic. But then when, they, when they're when made to like get into the weeds about what's actually going on and, and kind of like dig into the science and stuff, their argument starts to break down a bit. So you won't find them talking as much to actual experts or other experts in, in their field. Um, just something to kind of keep in mind, I feel like. Yeah. And I feel like it's an important point to note here when we talk about nutrition and positive change when you actively change things about the food that you eat that lead to positive health changes something you need to be very very aware of is that you're not just changing the food that you put in your body what you're doing is you're changing your behaviors you're changing your behaviors about how you go about putting food in your body and this is something dojo and i were talking about off air it's something i'm going to expand on much more in um in another episode and another couple social media posts that i have going and it's the idea that every one of these diets that you see on social media or every one of these social media personalities that are pretty prominent right now that are pushing a certain, I wouldn't say agenda, but a certain philosophy about nutrition, they all, every single one of them are saying the exact same thing. They're all saying the exact same thing. If you listen to them and you see what they're pushing, they're all pushing the exact same philosophy. Reduce, if not remove, your processed foods, which is not a bad thing. Everyone will agree with that. Eat mostly whole foods and then live an active lifestyle and get more in touch with you know those natural cycles. Get in the light dark cycle. Make sure you get up and you move your body. Make sure that you're doing everything you can to get the best sleep that you can. Make sure that you're managing stress because we know about the negative impacts that excess cortisol can have. Every single person, whether that is a plant-based advocate, whether that is a ketogenic diet advocate, whether that is a carnivore diet advocate, when you go down to the absolute root of what they're promoting, 
it's the exact same thing between all of them. And this is where the, this argument gets interesting because people like me and Dojo, who don't necessarily fall in any of these camps, we promote the exact same thing. The difference between what me and Dojo promote and everyone else that's say a dietitian, nutritionist or in the nutrition scientific community is that we don't have a great storyline or a story arc and something that is villainized that makes that interesting, that makes that argument very compelling to the average person. So when me and Dojo say, hey, you know what, you just need to cut out all your processed foods, you need to eat mostly whole food, you still eat a little bit here and there, but make sure you're also getting up and moving your body in a way you like, go get natural sunlight, make sure that you're doing, you know, some type of stress management and spend time with your loved ones because that's really good for you and boosting all these good hormones. You go, yeah, well, duh, like, okay, obviously. <laughs> And you go, well, yeah, but that's exactly what they're saying. But they go, no, 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 no. This guy said seed oils are the problem. And this is where it mm. gets really interesting in terms of storytelling because ketogenic diets, the villain in their diet is insulin. That's the villain. And then the, the villain, when we talk about carnival diets or people in that community, it's seed oils. So like Dojo said, now that person that doesn't want to listen to me or him because we're boring as, they've got this interesting character or this thing that they can blame seed oils are the problem to everything that's gone wrong in my life insulin that's the thing that's the problem that's gone wrong as long as i can fix that i'm good and this is where it gets interesting and when you look at it from an outside perspective it's blatantly obvious if you take that person who goes on a ketogenic diet and then they quote unquote control their insulin it's the exact same thing as what the person on the carnivore diet is doing the exact same thing as the person on the plant but what are they doing cutting out all of the processed food, eating mostly whole foods. They're sticking to a good regimented diet. They're probably calorie, more calorie controlled, more in touch with their body. They're doing everything we promote, but they're attributing all of those beneficial behavior changes to the removal of the villain in their story. So the removal of seed oils or the, the control of insulin or getting rid of you know saturated fats from animals, whatever the villain is that whoever has chosen to vilify in that scenario, that's is what gets the credit, not the positive behavior changes. So I think that's very, very important for people to understand here. And it's not like we come out and we're having a go at these. Like I'm not doing an episode about seed oils because I want to go out and have a, have a go at any particular health practitioner that's promoting it. Because we're in reality, we're all promoting the same thing. You just need to be very, very aware because, and I've spoken about this a lot, people tend to get very, very, very passionate when we talk about nutrition and diet because it forms such a strong part of our identity. Mm. When we identify as who we are, a big part of that is the food that we eat. So a lot of people, that's why you see people really, really passionate about being vegan, really, really passionate about following a carnival diet or plant-based or paleo, whatever it is, because it forms our identity. And as part of that, that kind of builds up and contributes this huge amount of dislike or hate towards whatever is vilified in that little community that you're in. And that's why people are so passionate about, you know what, seed oils are the absolute problem. It's no saturated fat. No, you should stop eating that. Whatever it is, that is why. And really when you get, I'm not, I don't want to say true scientists, but when you get people who can step back and look at the entirety of the situation, I, I won't say it, it, it's comical, but it is somewhat jocular when you look at it and you go, you guys are all arguing about the exact same thing. You're all saying <laughs> the exact same thing, but you've just, you just fell into this storyline where you've all picked a different villain to, to hate and you've all picked a certain storyline that you want to jump on. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if someone follows carnivore, if they fall, if they, if they positively change their health and their life for it, that's great. That's what we're all getting into this for. That's what we're all doing this for. The problem and the problem with social media when we're presenting a certain storyline that's worked for us is that's not how it works when we look at the population. And that's what me and Dojo, that's the, that's the area that we play in. That's the arena we have to fight in is the population. So when we go out and we say things, we have to make sure that what we're saying is best for the majority of the population of people listening not just mm. the people who have consigned themselves to these little camps where they pick a villain and they go fight everyone else, even though they're all doing the same <laughs> thing. That's why our story and our message that we put out with, along with all the other health practitioners, the, all the other dietitians and nutrition research, why it's so boring because we can't vilify one thing because we know as best the evidence, really, it's not that one thing. You could do it any which way. You've just got to get these behaviors and get that right. But the fact of the matter is it's just boring and no one wants to listen to that. That's all it is. 
<laughs> yeah, honestly, that's a really good way to summarize it all. Um, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I think let's wrap it up there. Again, we spoke about seed oils in this, but really we're talking about a bigger issue here. You could, you could do this podcast on anything. We could do it on the insulin weight loss model and talk about that and whatever and talk about keto. We're, we're kind of, I wouldn't say we're picking on. I think we're just presenting the information about seed oils and people in the carnival space. And don't get me wrong, like I, like, it, and obviously everyone's going to, going to sit here and be like, oh, they're bashing carnivore. I actually like a lot of the philosophies of what carnivore MD does. I like him in the way that he talks about a lot of these processes and how he gets people in to make those positive behavior change. I don't necessarily agree with some of the science he talks about. I think he, he overreaches a lot of the, the mechanisms that we just do not have a lot of the cannabinoid system. For example, what he talks about, I know for a fact I have obviously CBD is such a prominent thing in the combat sports space. And I am very, very fortunate to be connected with a lot of very smart people and scientists who specifically have PhDs in that area. I know we're just not there to make the yeah. comments that he makes about those things. But you know what? It's just having the sense in the mind to be able to be like, okay, well, let's step back and let's look at it for what it is. Kind of where MD does probably a lot of great work. A lot of great works helps a lot of people. And on a business side, I can absolutely respect like what Dojo said on the business side, he's selling something, he's doing that very well. You just have to, and, and I'm going to call it a moral and ethical backbone that me and <laughs> Dojo have to abide to. You have to step back and be like, okay, we have to appreciate that. that's not going to apply to everyone in the game we play we're playing for the masses and we want to help everyone. So we are very constricted to what we have to say. And unfortunately we can't have the villain in our story. We just have to put out the boring story of what we know works. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of like it at the end of the day is, is the boring stuff. Unfortunately is what works. Same as, same as jujitsu, same as combat sports, same as life, like fundamentals is, is always the most important, but everyone kind of wants to skip over it and get onto the fun stuff. So um yeah that's probably a good place to leave it i reckon yeah absolutely that's a good episode if you guys are listening to this let us know what you think let's if, if you guys think we're completely wrong let us know I, i'd absolutely love to hear your thoughts about it and i'd love to talk to you about it more shoot us a message let us know but give us some feedback what do you guys think of that episode? what do you think of seed oils what do you think of insulin any of these things what diet camp you're in just let us know i'd love to have more of these conversations and mm -hmm. dig deeper and just expand your thought process so hopefully you can step back and see the bigger picture but let's leave that one there, Dojo. Easy. All right. Catch you, Jordy.